Well, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, good evening and welcome to Uzbekistan. Thank you. Uh, we are really glad to have you here today and thank you for the opportunity given to organize this small talk with you. Well, uh, my first question is a bit personal one, if it's on mind. Is it your first visit to Uzbekistan or have you ever been to the country before? This is uh, the first time. I, I, we waited too long uh, because what a beautiful country and uh, what warm hospitality we have had since uh, being here this week. Uh, uh, my wife and I uh, visited uh, Bukhara, Samarkand, oh, really? and Tashkent. So we've seen uh, a lot of history and a lot of beauty and met a lot of wonderful people. That's fantastic. Your trip to Uzbekistan, was, was it a planet trip or just something? It's, uh, I've wanted to come here for a long time. Uh, and uh, the opportunity came this spring uh, as uh, part of uh, my work with the United Nations. I was in uh, Kazakhstan uh, last week at the Astana Forum, mm -hmm. which uh, brings a lot of people to talk about the challenges of the world economy and of Central Asia. And then knowing that we would be coming to Astana, we planned to spend a week in Uzbekistan and um, to both be tourists and to meet with the government officials and to meet with students. I have heard that you have been to the Westminster University in Tashkent and met some officials, government officials. If it is not a secret, could you please share a bit of your talks with the government officials and your lectures at the Westminster University in Tashkent? Sure, the big question for everybody uh, is how to achieve successful, sustainable development. And that means uh, economic development that is also socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable. And so I have been uh, having discussions today uh, with the UN country team, with the faculty and students at Westminster International University uh, and with the several senior government officials. I'm uh, very optimistic about uh, Uzbekistan's uh, great potential because now uh, there is uh, a lot of interest in the connectivity uh, throughout Eurasia and Uzbekistan is the natural connection uh, east-west, north-south, being the center of the region. Being in the center of Eurasia, uh, of course, throughout history, uh, it's been in the center of a lot of history. But in the 21st century, it, uh, Uzbekistan is well connected uh, with the Middle East, with China, Russia. with Russia, uh, with uh, South Asia. So this is a very exciting time. Uh, if this region stays in peace and if it does a good job of focusing on the real needs of the populations, there's a great potential. Thank you. You've been at the forefront of intellectual work for both MDGs and SDGs as a special advisor to the UN Secretary Generals Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon and now Antonio Guterres. Looking back at the last two decades, could you please elaborate what was the harder thing you had to overcome? The logical resistance, bureaucracy, or lack of international governance architecture? The idea of both the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals was that the world should agree on uh, priorities and on cooperation together to solve the problems of poverty or the problems of environmental uh, danger. And I've had the pleasure now for 20 years to be working on the idea of global goals 
that we implement together. There have been some very positive developments, but also a lot of frustration because global cooperation is not so easy. Uh, often governments aren't too interested. Uh, they're not interested enough in some of these issues. And global cooperation is quite difficult because so many times there are conflicts, uh, so much, there's been so much war, uh, so much division. Uh, my view is we should be cooperating everywhere. But look at even the attitude of the United States towards China right now. Very nasty, uh, very uh, competitive, uh, trying to block China rather than to work together. And this is quite dangerous, but this is what I've seen a lot, uh, that rather than cooperating, we waste our time, our money, our resources through conflict. And uh, all the time I'm trying to explain how conflict only creates losers everywhere, whereas cooperation can create winners everywhere. But, you know, uh, sometimes uh, politicians in my country, uh, the United States, don't think very clearly. That's also true in other places. So they fall into conflict even when it's going to lead to bad results. Speaking about the conflict between the United States of America and China, do you really think that the economic war between these two powerful countries affect other nations, including Uzbekistan? Well, oh, if there's a full-fledged economic war, it would be terrible uh, for everybody, uh, starting with the U.S. and China, but it would definitely uh, affect Uzbekistan, I'm sorry to say, because uh, these are the two largest economies in the world. And if they cooperate, the world economy will grow uh, and there will be new innovations and positive developments. But if uh, they fall into conflict with each other uh, and every other country has to choose sides uh, or uh, just hold, uh, uh, try to prevent uh, the uh, roof falling down, this would be very, very dangerous. I'm worried. This is a conflict started by the United States. It's very unwise. It's very dangerous, very provocative, because I think uh, many American leaders are jealous of China, uh, that China's become so powerful that it doesn't have to listen to the United States. And uh, these US politicians uh, are pretty arrogant and they don't want any competitors. Uh, and so they're trying to uh, stop China's development. I don't think it will work, but the cost of this could be quite high. So I hope that uh, both sides reach an agreement. And I hope that the US attitude of putting on these tariffs and creating these troubles uh, stops because it's quite dangerous. In the example of Uzbekistan, what can you say? Uh, how to achieve cooperation between the political parties and e economic parties uh, for better sustainable development? Uzbekistan is uh, uh, definitely in a complicated part of the world. Uh, you're surrounded by lots of uh, powers. powers that throughout history have not been simple. <laughs> you know, these are powerful countries, China, Russia, uh, and uh, uh, Iran, Persia, uh, the Middle East, uh, South Asia, India, and so on. These are all powerful regions, and Uzbekistan's in the middle of all of this. If these regions see the positive side of cooperation, then Uzbekistan is in a great position to help interconnect China, Europe, the Middle East, Iran, India, Russia. If these powers are in conflict, uh, then of course uh, Uzbekistan's in a very difficult position because uh, nobody then uh, makes connectivity, they just make conflict. So Uzbekistan's doing a very good job right now of making good relations with the neighbors. And this, I think, is extremely smart.
and extremely important. And I'm optimistic that Eurasia, connecting Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, uh, could work together cooperatively. If that's the case, then I think this would be a great uh, period of development for Uzbekistan. So if I understood it correctly, what you're saying is in order to survive, Uzbekistan should try to achieve cooperation with all the powers of the region. There, there are no uh, countries with which Uzbekistan has a natural conflict. Uzbekistan can have good relations with China, Russia, Iran, India, all of, and of course your next door neighbors uh, in Central Asia with Tajikistan, uh, with uh, Turkmenistan and so on. And that is the foreign policy of this country to try to have good relations with all of the neighbors. Sometimes the United States says you have to choose. We're in a war with China, a trade war. You have to choose the American side. This is not a good idea. Uh, Uzbekistan should have a good balanced relationship uh, and it should uh, be a hub for cooperation, a place where people come if they want to do business throughout South Asia or if they want to interconnect China and uh, the Middle East or China and Europe, uh, all roads should lead or could lead through Tashkent uh, or Bukhara as they once did in history. Uh, and so I think that this is uh, an opportunity for this country, but it depends on, of course, good policies within Uzbekistan to be open to the neighbors. And I think your president is very clear on that and it's bringing a lot of hope uh, to the region. And it also depends on a bit of good luck uh, that the big powers don't fall into a conflict, in which case everybody is going to lose. As an economist, what can you say about the current pace of Uzbekistan's economic development? I think that uh, right now Uzbekistan uh, is in an acceleration period of uh, faster development because uh, now, uh, especially as the government is making reforms and opening the economy and the president is visiting the neighbors and establishing or re-establishing good relations. And as China is creating its Belt and Road Initiative, this is a good time for Uzbekistan to make new businesses, new connections, and to benefit from being a hub within this bigger region. So I think that what we're seeing right now is an acceleration of both the structural reforms and of the opportunities for development. For 14 years, you headed the Earth Institute at Columbia University. What do you consider your most important achievement at the Institute? The idea of the Earth Institute was to work on sustainable development, which means that we were working on issues like climate change, global warming, ending poverty, uh, improving health care, uh, all of the things that were part of the MDGs and now the SDGs. What's very interesting about all of those issues is that you need a big perspective of economics, finance, business, uh, ecology, uh, climatology, um, engineering, all different disciplines of uh, thought. So usually uh, professionals in these areas just work with their own colleagues. They don't work with the colleagues in all of those other disciplines. But at the Earth Institute, the specialty was to bring all of these different groups together to work on a common challenge. I would like to see that idea spread within the universities in Uzbekistan to create some special centers or institutes of sustainable development. Uh, for instance, there is a proposal to create uh, a Silk Road University 
or a Silk Road Institute in Samarkand. In Samarkand. This is a fantastic idea. And I think that uh, scholars in this country could become specialists on the connectivity challenge. But to do so would mean to combine good engineering, uh, economics, business, finance, conservation biology, uh, land use, and so forth. All of these different specialties working together to really understand the issues in all of their complexity. And if Uzbekistan goes in that direction, that will be a great skill developed here uh, that isn't very common that can play a very constructive role. Can you name some uh, challenges that Uzbekistan is facing, economic challenges, in the next five years? Well, Uzbekistan faces uh, the challenge of uh, a complicated region uh, and putting into practice these uh, somewhat abstract ideas because it's easy to say connectivity, but it's much harder to build fast rail, fiber, renewable energy uh, systems, and so on. So implementation becomes a real challenge. Having the expertise within the country, young people that are trained to say, I know how to make a, a cooperative uh, investment together with China and Iran, for example. Uh, th those are skills that need to be built and developed more. But that is the real opportunity in the next few years. Professor, over the years you have made bold policy proposals at the global level, including increasing foreign aid from developed to developing countries or taxing global financial transactions to finance poverty uh, reduction and so forth. Do you still stand behind those proposals today? I uh, have been in a uh, kind of fight for these beliefs for a long time and um, every once in a while uh, I find a kind of breakthrough that some of the ideas that I've been advocating are implemented and then I like to see uh, the positive results that come from that. So with foreign aid, uh, it's not easy to convince other governments to give more aid, uh, but when they do, the results are very good. Many lives saved or more children in school uh, or uh, new investments in infrastructure. Um, and so I feel very uh, much that these ideas that I've been promoting are worth the effort even though most of the time I don't think the advice is implemented. Uh, that's true of anybody's advice. There's always opposition or uh, inaction or lack of cooperation or distraction uh, or uh, trying other approaches. But I'm happy with the recommendations that I've made and uh, occasionally they are actually implemented. Uzbekistan is a developing country. What do you think can the country rely on foreign aid and investments? Uzbekistan is a country that um, can make a lot of uh, rapid advance because the population is well educated, uh, the region is at peace, you have some quite uh, rapidly growing neighboring countries like China or India, which mean that the market for goods that Uzbekistan sells is growing. There's a lot of interest in investors coming here. There are a lot more tourists coming here. The number of tourist arrivals doubled this past year. And uh, that's both because people are interested in coming here and because the government implemented easier procedures for instance, uh, allowing visas upon arrival or other um, administrative matters that made it easier to come to Uzbekistan as a tourist. So I think that uh, there really are a lot of areas of quick progress possible and the government is working quite hard to implement those. 
taking into consideration the geographical location of Uzbekistan and its political uh, system, what recommendations can you give to the country to develop its economy and the well-being of the people? I would say 20 years ago, I would have been a little more pessimistic uh, because as a double landlocked country. One of the two double landlocked countries in the world. There are only two, and Liechtenstein is the other one. And Liechtenstein is a tiny little country uh, with a few hundred thousand people uh, in the middle of uh, prosperous Europe. So Uzbekistan is in a unique position, really. And uh, it's a big challenge, I always thought, to be double landlocked. But now in an age of connectivity and with China being a successful economy, with India achieving growth, uh, with uh, Europe being a big, big market, uh, this is a real opportunity for Uzbekistan. Uh, and I'm quite optimistic that Uzbekistan can become a hub of Central Asia that connects countries, that brings a lot of tourism, that brings a lot of students to study here, uh, and uh, that becomes uh, a very uh, skillful uh, at uh, helping to make bridges uh, across uh, the region. And I certainly would like to do anything I can to help Uzbekistan achieve that great potential. That's great. The last question, how Uzbekistan can establish, let's say, advanced research centers in the country, like in the United States? I think that there is a lot of international interest in Uzbekistan and uh, a lot of international interest in Central Asia and in Eurasian connectivity. So my view is if uh, Uzbekistan goes forward with ideas like the Silk Road University of Samarkand, it will not be hard to find very wonderful partners, scholars, uh, advanced uh, students, uh, and so forth, who will come and participate in these activities and quickly raise the international profile uh, and uh, the interest of the activities underway. So I, this is something I would like to see happen. And since I direct a network of universities for the United Nations for the Sustainable Development Goals, I've said to the government officials that I'm very uh, positively excited to help bring this global network to the benefit of Uzbekistan by helping to bring partners for the universities. And I invited uh, Westminster International University this morning to become a member of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and we're already by uh, two hours later starting the process. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for your meaningful conversation and it was really productive. We hope to see you back here in Uzbekistan again. Thank you very much. Thanks for the hospitality and thank you for having me on the show. Thank you very much.